Hello everyone. So for this module we're actually going to start wrapping up a lot of our Python uh, theory and working with Python. We'll still be doing a little bit of it when we get into Docker but most of that is just uh, realistically importing a script into a container but we'll get to that next module. So what this module is all about is this is kind of uh, Cisco's, uh, how do you put it? this is their marketing module. Um, probably my least favorite portion in the book. I really wish they wouldn't have covered so much about their platforms and more covered more Python theory and API theory and delve a little deeper into that. But nevertheless, they went ahead and gave a couple chapters which are more uh, marketing. So what we're going to do is basically collapse all those chapters um, which cover you know their security platform, SD-WAN, uh, cloud-based LAN, their LAN SDN solution, and their compute solutions all into one because the chances of you actually going to a place and working on all those platforms at once is pretty rare. Usually companies have themselves split up, um, you know, maybe they're running Dell for their servers, not Cisco, but they're running Cisco for their data center and their LAN, and maybe they're running uh, Fortinet or Palo Alto for their security solution. It just all depends on how the company is set up, but I still have yet to see a 100% Cisco shop. So that's why I kind of say this is more of the marketing section. But we are actually going to start to delve into some of Cisco's products, and they are doing a very good job at leading the way in educating the industry on APIs, uh, software-defined networking, automation. So we're also going to look into some resources that you can use to further your education. So this is going to be Cisco Platform API. Our objectives for this module is to do an overview of Cisco DevNet, which is their open, free tool where you can go. It's developer.cisco.com, and we'll learn all the things that Cisco DevNet has to offer you. I'm a pretty big fan of Cisco DevNet. We're going to introduce uh, the Cisco various platforms and their APIs. All, almost all their platforms nowadays have an API that's exposed so that we can connect uh, different systems together or automate using the API. We are going to be covering a little more in-depth, which is the Cisco DNA Center Software-Defined Networking LAN solution. So this is Cisco's product for software-defined networking that you would be most fami familiar with as this is what you learned in your Cisco courses. Simple routing and switching, no data center, no security, just routing and switching. Um, they, their wireless does fall into the DNA Center family but we're not going to be focused too much on that. What we're really focused on is interacting with a software-defined networking controller and that controller controls just LAN access and basic routing and switching. We're going to be going over the Cisco WebEx Teams collaboration tool and conducting a webhook with the collaboration tool looking at the different products that are out there that you could use other than Cisco because the theory does not change from product to product. They usually all offer the same features, especially as it relates to APIs and webhooks. And then we're going to be doing a webhook demonstration with WebEx Teams where when we make an update to a GitHub repository, such as opening up a pull request, it is going to send a message automatically to a WebEx Teams channel. And then we're also going to be covering API documentation, what it is and how to use it. When it comes to APIs, documentation is key because without documentation, you can't just figure out an API. You have to have the documentation there in order to know what kind of authentication that it uses, um, the path for the resource that you're looking for, and what the request body needs to look like. All right, so overview, we're going to be covering Cisco DevNet, uh, the Cisco various Cisco platforms, API documentation, what it is, how to use it, and where to get it. Uh, we're going to be covering Cisco DNA Center. We'll be doing a couple of API calls to Cisco's DNA Center, Software Defined Networking Solution. We're doing a little bit of uh, work with Cisco WebEx Teams where we're going to go ahead and set up a webhook based on our GitHub repository, and we're going to do webhooks to a specific channel. We'll move into a little demo, and then finally we'll move into our summary. Cisco DevNet. So Cisco DevNet is developer.cisco.com, where you can go create a free account, and it's really a big free learning platform to cover things, uh, these next generation networking solutions. So they have different learning tracks from the data center to security, um, application delivery, 
basic LAN routing and switching, wireless, uh, collaboration, all these different learning tracks and you can go learn how to use APIs and the different tools for interacting with APIs and you can actually uh, conduct different labs on some of these Cisco solutions. They have a lot of free video courses on things such as APIs, um, Python, Ansible, Docker, so there's a lot of free video courses on there. They even have some Always On Sandboxes, which we will be interacting with the Cisco DNA Center Always On Sandbox, where you can actually go and practice. You can make actual API calls to real Cisco solutions. They have a code exchange where you can go to exchange code with other developers. Perhaps you're trying to do something that someone's already developed um, a code for, you can go there and actually exchange codes. Or if you develop something that you think other people would find useful, you can go share your code with others. Uh, they have the ecosystem exchange and they also have support. Support being, hey, I'm trying to do this and I can't figure it out. Could someone help me out? You know, either the community can answer, but Cisco is always monitoring a lot of their support channels so that you can actually ask a Cisco person for help on some of your code or issues that you're encountering. You can also go there to see different DevNet events. You can find study groups if you're working on a CERT or want to learn more about a sp specific product or solution. You can go uh, join into specific study groups. They have challenges and one of my favorite things is they have a lot of labs where you can walk through and actually get hands-on training. Many of the tools that they're going to cover have already been covered in this course, so if anything it would be a great place to go and get a refresher or expand on the information that you've learned in this course. Okay, so I just did a search for Cisco DevNet, which uh, brings up developer.cisco.com, so I'm just going to go ahead and click here. And here I am on Cisco DevNet. Now, I already have an account, but again, it is free to sign up, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just log in with my Google account. And now I'm signed into uh, my DevNet account. And I just wanted to kind of come in here and give you a little walk around of you know, some of the different things. So here's those support forms we were talking about. Um, these, this Discover and these different learning paths are awesome. I mean, they got learning tracks, video courses, different videos that you can watch. Here's the DevNet certifications uh, and DevNet associate fundamentals course, which is uh, what your book covers actually, that um, your book is the Cisco certified DevNet associate um, certification guide if you would like to work on your certification for DevNet. Um, and then they've got different technologies right here where you can come and you can look at here's Internet of Things, uh, cloud, networking, data center, where they really get into um, ACI, infrastructure as code, the Nexus, um, DHCP, DNS, and IPAM, different collaboration tools, security, open source tools. I mean, there's all sorts of fun stuff in here, and these are all topics that we have been covering. Um, here you can see Cisco with Ansible, Cisco with Terraform, uh, SecureX. I would have to look into SecureX. Not sure about that one, but as we get into our Ansible modules, looks like they're expanding on that here. And then here you got explore different platforms. Get started with what DevNet has to offer. So if you're going to come here, I recommend uh, just go ahead and go into this start now which will then take you to um, a list of some of their different learning tracks and courses. So here we've got a networking 101 which has three labs and it's two hours of uh, instruction. Coding and APIs which is eight, out, uh, eight labs and four hours of instruction and you can see it goes into data center networking, Meraki, WebEx, um, clouds and containers, security, data center, internet of things and edge computing, all sorts of good stuff. So you can see I've done a few of these. Um, you know, I've done networking 101, coding and APIs, uh, the AND networking, which is uh, DNA Center, and then this is the uh, data center ACI solution. I've done Meraki, but this is a great place to really kind of come and get started. So really just kind of wanted to take you here and show you that um, it's kind of an awesome little tool that uh, Cisco's using to kind of help the rest of the community, um, you know, keep up with where this industry is going. All right, so the different Cisco platforms. So I went ahead and threw all of them up here. So you can see there's a lot. Um, and that's what I mean by I've never seen a place that has like they're a full Cisco shop. I'm sure Cisco is a full Cisco shop, but uh, usually you're going to have a mix of different vendors. So I'm going to just go down real quick and kind of give an example of what each one is. So you've got Cisco Meraki, which is basically their cloud platform. 
Uh, they purchased the Meraki company not too long ago. I actually did an interview with Cisco Meraki, and basically it's just a way for you to offer routing, switching, wireless, security, uh, phones, cameras, and you can manage all of it through a cloud platform. All the device needs is an internet connection. If the device can reach the internet, it is then going to call out to its cloud um, controller and you can make your changes via the cloud so you can manage your network from a centralized dashboard available on the internet and your network could be wherever it is in the world. Cisco DNA Center which is basically their LAN access uh, software defined networking solution so that covers their um, LAN access as well as wireless and then this one's a very big popular um, this is one of I would say one of their flagship SDN products is the Cisco application centric infrastructure otherwise known as Cisco ACI Cisco ACI is their software defined networking solution for the data center it's very popular it's doing very well and it's a really big topic in almost any organization that is trying to bring their data center to the next level and next generation of networking Cisco Victella, which is their software-defined WAN. I am a SD WAN nut because it solves so many problems, and I've actually set it up, and after I set it up, I realized why it was so valuable. Um, basically, you set up all these health checks to different servers or different targets, and it's going to choose the best path based on how those health checks are doing. So no more having to set up all these manual checks and if this check fails then go take this route or if this route is no longer available then you have to take this route. It's all done dynamically. Very cool solution. There's a lot more other products out there. I say that because Cisco's not leading the way in SD-WAN. There's a couple other vendors that are doing really well with SD-WAN. One of the biggest ones is Fortinet and VMware. Um, Palo Alto just purchased CloudGenix. But SD-WAN is a really big topic as well. Cisco UCS, so that is basically their servers. Um, Cisco offers their own servers. They're very expensive servers, which is why not a lot of people have them, but they are very reliable. They're very great. Um, that's what the UCS stands for. It's a unified compute solution. So it's basically, you know, virtualized servers. And you've got a manager, a director, intersight. I'm not too delved into Cisco UCS servers because I work in the networking space. But I do know that they are really solid boxes and they're pretty popular. They're also pretty expensive. Uh, Cisco's Unified Communication Ma Manager, otherwise known as CUCM. That is their VoIP, one of their VoIP solutions. They've got many different VoIP solutions. Um, you know, Unified Call Manager, Communications Manager, um, but that's basically it. You know, it's their VoIP solution. So the dial plan lives there. Everyone's phone numbers lives there. Their extensions live there. Your voicemail lives there. And then you've got uh, Cisco Finesse, which I'm not too familiar with, but I know that's um, it's like their VoIP solution for the cloud. Then we have WebEx Teams, which we will be downloading, installing, and doing a little bit of work with in this module. And it's just a collaboration platform. So many of you use collaboration platforms on a daily basis. You may not realize it. Um, you know, like the earlier versions of collaboration platforms were like Skype, but then Microsoft has evolved into Microsoft Teams. You've got Slack. Uh, you've got Flock. There's all sorts of collaboration tools out there, and they all offer a lot of the same features. And then everything else is pretty much um, all security. So Umbrella, which is their uh, DNS, it's a basically like a DNS firewall. And then you got Cisco Firepowers, which is their firewalls or next generation firewall, if you will, because usually firewalls now do a lot more than just firewalling. They do IPS, IDS, application control. Um, Cisco did move uh, their advanced malware protection, which is AMP, so that does uh, things like virus scanning. They've moved that off of that platform. Uh, web application firewalls. Then you got Cisco Identity Services Engine, which is another very popular product of theirs. Um, very big, especially in the BYOD realm. I hear it's very reliable. It's been really hard to get my hands on a Cisco, a Cisco ICE server because it is another one of their platforms that is quite expensive. Um, usually their expensive platforms are pretty reliable and they do pretty well. I've heard great things about uh, Cisco ICE. I've also heard that it can be uh, quite the nightmare, but once it's set up, that it does work really well and it performs how it's supposed to. And then Cisco ThreatGrid, not, don't know too much about it. Um, I know it's on the cloud. I'm, I believe it's just the central management pane for um, a lot of their Cisco security solutions. 
Almost everything that I've mentioned right here or everything that I have mentioned here has exposed APIs in some way and or can interact with APIs in some way, shape, or form or fashion, which allows all of these products to be tied into other products. So for example, I am deploying a new Fortinet um, WAN right now, and part of that Fortinet WAN at the data center has a plugin for Cisco ACI. So I don't need to actually set all these up manually to communicate with each other. They have exposed APIs it's built specifically for these other vendors' platforms. So I can just point it to ACI, and then ACI can point back to the firewall, and then my firewalls are all dynamic as a, as a software-defined networking solution is, and the firewall rules are all dynamic, so it's pretty cool. API documentation. I put on here, it's, an, it's a requirement, it's not an option, um, because you have, there's no way you could build a request without that documentation. It, it would be impossible. How does it authenticate? What is the path? What is the base URI? What are the different HTTP methods that you're going to use when you're trying to do something, such as you know providing it a username and password? Are you trying to get devices? Are you trying to add devices? Are you trying to make a configuration change to your network? Are you no matter what you're trying to do, API documentation is everything. You have to have that documentation in order to know how to build out your requests. So all the documentations come with a basic description. They'll give you the HTTP method, the base URI, you know, that, and that would be something like example.com or example.com forward slash API. The URL for the request, which is going to be the path to get there, so it could be, you know, version one um, devices interfaces, for example. The different parameters that you can pass into your request in order to maybe get specific information that you're looking for rather than the entire request is one. And when we actually go to do some of these requests, you'll see what I'm talking about as far as some of the responses that you get back can be quite um, large. So you may have to use parameters in order to filter out the information that you're actually looking for. They usually have some example responses on there as well as some example errors and the different error codes and what those different error codes mean. And we'll be taking a look at some uh, example documentation here in just a moment. Include uh, a link to the DNA Center API documentation in the lab. And what I found is it gets updated way too often for me to include a link because the link always breaks. So it is easier just to say, go ahead and just do a search for Cisco DNA Center API documentation. And the one you want is going to be the developer.cisco.com because um, that's Cisco DevNet where they host all of their API documentation. You can see it even says docs and DNA center. If I click on, which one is it? So they've got intent API version 1.3.1. So I'm just going to go ahead and click that. And here we are on the API documentation. Everything is collapsed, but um, here we can see like access a request token. So here's how we would um, authenticate and uh, use the token, um, authenticate and receive a token. Now there's a drop down here. Let me make sure. Okay, I am on the latest release, I believe. Um, let me just go ahead and make sure. All right. Yep. Ooh. There we go. All right, now I'm back. So this is the latest one. It's a 1.3.1. You can see they have older versions there, but since we're going to be working with um, the always on sandbox, Cisco does make sure that that is always on the latest code release. So here it just gives you kind of an overview of what it is that you're actually looking for that you would like to grab, you know, whatever you want your request to be. So we're going to need to um, generate an access token. So we'll just go ahead and take a look at this one first. And you can see it tells us what the HTTP method is going to be and then the path to generate that token. And you might be saying, well, this does not seem like a lot of documentation. It's because this isn't the whole thing. This is um, the summary. You know, if you just wanted to, if you were more familiar with APIs and you just wanted to get this thing up and going, you could come here and just see all the summaries. Um, but if I click this, then you can see it opens up to everything that I need. And it even says here, content type. Uh, this is required in the request. Authorization, this is required. And then it tells you what you should actually be putting it and uh, what the description is. Uh, requested body content type. Default values application JSON, which we're going to be using. And then for authorization, it says basic auth, base64 encoding. And that's just basic username and password. 
And then it has uh, responses and it says response, constant, type, application, JSON, but I could change that if I wanted to. However, uh, this request only offers it in application JSON format and you basically have two status codes that you're going to get either 200 okay and you're going to here's a example of what you should see returned back to you which is just a json formatted um, object with a token and then a value of your token or you're going to get a 401 which is going to be you entered the wrong credentials uh, but this is a pretty small one and it gives you a description of what it is right there i already said that i'm going to be doing a get devices so if I come down here, um, here we see get DNA attend API version one, get device list. It gives me that nice little summary right there and it says network devices. So this is probably what I want because um, you can see the same request, but with a post would be to add a network device. Here I could uh, do interface, get the interface count, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just check out this one right here. And here you can see it gives me a description of what the API call is actually gonna uh, spit back out or what the API call does. And we know it's a git, so I'm retrieving information. Here are the different parameters that you can use. Notice that not all of them are required because you don't need to use all the parameters. And then down here, you can see it's still giving us an application uh, JSON, our response, and what it would look like with a 200 OK. And here is an example of a response for a single managed device. And then it gives you all the different error codes that you could be seeing and what the problem is if you are actually getting one of those error codes. Now you should also have a base URL. I thought that was up here somewhere. Um, maybe it is not. Uh, ah, this actually looks a lot better. Um, go to API lifecycle guides. Ah, that's it. Um, this actually, I wonder why I didn't see that here. Okay, no problem. Um, what I like about right here and why I kind of was like, oh, this might be a little bit better is because um, for you it has this nice little get started and you can um, read the get started page and not to mention it seems to be walking you through how to use Postman, how to set up Postman, and how to generate your auth, um, generate your authorization token with Postman. And here they're even uh, giving you an example for the Cisco DevNet Always on Sandbox. Use the following credentials and that is what we are going to be using. Um, basic auth and here it's telling you how to re retrieve a, a token and here's how to get your inventory. So this might be a little bit better for you uh, to come and use but what I didn't like is it has this um, Cisco DNA 2.1.2, which I thought we were on the latest version, apparently not. Um, but we can go ahead and come to API. Ah, yeah, no, these are looking a lot better. So it looks like they just updated it again. And this is why I told you uh, it's actually probably better to just go ahead and Google it and see what that spits back out at you because they are updating this stuff that often. So here's the authentication request. Um, here it's giving us the headers, the response codes. And then you could even run this, um, change the configuration so I could change the host, um, the base path. This is pretty nice. I like the changes that they made to it. And if I went to devices, um, get device list, here you can see the path is the same. Here's the description, operation ID, get device list, and here are the different parameters again. And all the response codes that we would get. And we can even expand out our headers to see uh, content type, application JSON, accept application JSON. I could add to these headers, um, and I could even grab a template as Python requests or curl. And I could just copy and paste this out of here if I wanted to. So pretty cool stuff, um, except this does not give us a base URL for the DNA Center Always on Sandbox. But that is why, um, as you can see, API documentation is so important. And really recommend you coming in and checking out this, um, this overview and getting started. Because that looks like a great way to actually help you out on your labs and um, just kind of give you something else that you can use as a reference 
to actually come in, generate a token, and then use it for a follow-on request. All right, so Cisco DNA Center, it is their software-defined LAN, so it's routing, switching, and wireless. It composes of a few different things. One is, you know, we know that from our earlier lectures that an SDN solution has, you know, three basic components, and that is an application, a controller, and a network device. So for the Cisco DNA Center software-defined LAN, uh, the network devices are going to be Catalyst 9000 switches, Catalyst 9000 wireless LAN controllers. Those switches are all uh, also do layer three, so they work act as the router as well. Um, I'd have to look at the exact models of router to see what works with their um, software defined with Cisco DNA Center, but I do know that the new Catalyst 9Ks are kind of the flagship for the network device. And then we have the uh, controller and the application which are all built into one and it comes as a rack mounted server so a single rack mounted server which has the actual application for DNA Center living on it as well as the network controller and that communicates down to your network devices to make configuration change um, get information from the network etc etc it is not a data center it is not the WAN or the wide area network for the data center that would be Cisco ACI for the wide area network you'd probably want to look at Viptela or some kind of SD WAN functionality the authentication for this is it's going to use HTTP basic auth which is a simple username and password and then once you use your basic auth you generate a token which expires after a specific amount of time and then you use that token for your follow-on requests and we'll, this is what our lab is actually going to be covering is how to um, generate a token get a token and then use that token for a follow-on API request and over here we've got the different elements again you know the application the controller which all come as one single rack mounted server and the Cisco Catalyst 9k layer 3 switches and wireless LAN controller for my examples I'm going to be doing get devices which is just going to get all the devices that are managed by that Cisco software defined networking controller or that Cisco DNA Center solution so it will spit out all the information on all the devices that that SDN solution is managing Okay, so what I'm going to be doing here now is uh, creating an API call to Cisco DNA Center Always On Sandbox. So I'm going to go ahead and launch Postman. And I'm also going to pull up a web browser. And uh, the Cisco oops, DNA Center Always On Sandbox. sandbox all right these are both ads and sandbox Cisco DevNet okay cool so I'll go ahead and click here because I'm gonna need the username and password and also the base URL to get started I'm gonna log in Google credentials because that is what I use to sign up for Cisco DevNet. And here you can see all of the different sandboxes that Cisco has to offer on their uh, DevNet platform. So I see ACI here. Um, keep going down. There we go. Uh, Cisco DNA Center always on sandbox. And it looks like they just basically have um, a few different versions. So I'll just go ahead and click this one. And you can make a reservation or you can actually um, just go ahead and um, start making API calls to it. So for this one, we don't necessarily need a reservation, but down here you can see Sandbox Access and it gives me the uh, base URL, URL to go to as well as the username and password to get in. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just launch the base URL so that you can see what it is that we're actually connecting to. 
because as we've discussed, you know, a software-defined networking solution consists of an application. So what does that application look like? Well, this is the application. So this is a real software-defined networking solution. Close it. Cisco. Cisco one. I thought I put them in right. Yeah, I put it in right the first time. DevNet user. Ah. And now I am in Cisco DNA Center um, software defined networking application. taking a minute to load um, but here I'm basically I'm going to be presented with a dashboard where I can uh, take a tour learn more um, if I go into this question mark there's even a link to the API reference if I click this it redirects me to developer.cisco.com uh, docs and then it takes me to the actual API docs that we were just looking at so here we go. Now I'm in a nice little dashboard of everything. So I can see I'm managing four network devices. I have two sites. Uh, looks like I've got two DNA licensed devices, a couple different images, and some network profiles. And what does all this stuff mean? Well, that's where you have to start learning the uh, software defined networking solution that you're working with. So DNA Center has its own set of features. Another vendor would have its set of features. but um, here's the menu on the left, and you can come click through some of these features um, as you would want to. But again, this is not where, you know, the next-gen network engineer is not going to become a expert at learning how to navigate a web application. That's going to be set for, you know, perhaps like an analyst, um, a NOC, SOC, a help desk person, because it's they're much easier to use in a much... Um, they're easier to use and it's really just navigating a GUI, you know, anyone can really navigate a GUI. Uh, but you do need to know a little bit of the theory that goes underneath it. So what we are here to do is we are here to actually set up some, so I've got uh, software defined networking collection, we're here to set up some API calls to Cisco's DNA Center. So here's this collection and I'm going to go ahead and add a folder and I will call this one a DNA Center. And I will just put, you know, um, requests for Cisco DNA Center always on sandbox. Okay, and I'll create this folder. And the folder is empty, so now I'm going to go ahead and create a new request. And for the request name, I am going to be put it as a generate token. Sorry if you can hear Selena in the background. <laughs> um, and the request description is going to be uh, generates authorization token. And I will put that in my DNA center, save to DNA center. All right, cool. So, uh, but it's not a git, it is going to be a post. So I may need to, um, should save it again. Let me see if I can't edit that. Just because I don't like that stuff. Okay, update. Oh, it's still showing it as a git. All right, no big deal. Um, what I can do is I can just delete that. And I'll go ahead and set this request up again just because I like to see what my method is next to it. So. Generate token generates authorization token. It's in DNA Center. Whoops. DNA Center. Save to DNA Center. Ah, it's still showing it as. Oh, well, it should update uh, once we actually push it. Hopefully it does. Okay. So let's actually get into doing that. So your lab also is going to ask you to uh, create a new environment, which we are going to do. So if I come over here and um, click this little I, you can see I have no environment, so I'm going to add an environment, and I will call this uh, DNA Center. Uh, for the first variable, 
we will go ahead and put in a username and password. And then we're going to create token with no initial or current values. So username is going to be a devnet user. And we'll go ahead and leave the initial value. We'll update the current value. And the password was uh, Cisco123. Exclamation token stays empty. And we'll go ahead and add this. Close that. Now we'll come over, select this environment, DNA Center, and we'll uh, use the I to verify that we can see our variables, username and password, set to DevNet user and Cisco123. Now if we come back over and take a look at our documentation, We've got the authentication API right here, so it's telling us we need to generate a post, and here is the path for that request. But we need to give it the base URL first, which is going to be this. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that out of here, and I'll paste that into my request. I'll come back to the documentation. that paste that into the request DNA system API version one all right that all looks good uh, but it does say we've got some headers that we need to add here so I can even expand these out and so I've got uh, three it looks like authorization content type and accept so let's go ahead and add those headers so if we come to our headers we can see okay everything's right there except they already have one for it does it allow me to change it does not so I'll go ahead and uh, uncheck that and just do an accept over here and I'll put application JSON no application JSON we'll add a new one for uh, content type And we can always come back here, check content type, application JSON, accept application JSON, authorization is going to be a string. Content type, application JSON. All right, and then um, for the next one, it says authorization is going to be a string, but you'll notice we have this authorization tab right here. So I'm going to select this, and it says inherit from parent, which is not what I want. Uh, we're going to do basic auth as per. it's in my template authorization string oh it doesn't have it in there ah, string composed of basic followed by spaces followed by base 64 encoding of username and not including the quotes for example basic where is okay so it gives us a little bit of information right there but also if we go into our uh, guides uh, gets generate an authorization token uh, down here you can see it even says uh, choose basic auth for authorization. So we're going to go ahead and stick with that and put in the username and password, which we have stored as variables. So I've selected basic auth. Now, how do we use these variables? We've named one username and password, and now we need to reference them in the request. So to do that, we're going to use double curly braces. And inside of those double curly braces, I will put a username. And I'll do another double curly braces. Go ahead and show the password because we're not actually putting the password in. But if I just do my uh, first two, you can see it's giving me a G for global, or I can just start typing and I can do pass. And then you can see the E for environment shows up and it shows me the value right there. So I'm going to do E and it finished it off for me. I can hide my password again now, it's no big deal. And let's go ahead, um, I shouldn't have any other parameters. My headers are done. OK, sweet. And there's nothing in the body because I am just passing it, my username and password, to this request to generate a token. So let's go ahead and see if that works. 
All right, so I can see I got something down. Um, it looks like I got a status 404 not found. The request resource could not be found, but may be available again in the future. Okay, so I have an error. Uh, let's go back to our documentation and check it out. Oh, did I get out of there? Okay. Uh, API system. Uh, I'm not sure which version of DNA Center I'm on. So it says uh, in Cisco DNA Center version 1.2.6 and above, the URL must be in this form uh, for older versions of DNA Center. So I may have misspoken. I'm not sure what version of code we are running here. Let's see if we can't figure it out. Um, but we can do an about. No, version 2.1.2.5, that looks right. So, okay. Click on API reference again and 212x. I am on 2125. Okay, so that's good. And we'll click this API, API authentication, authentication DNA system API version one auth token. Okay, this may be to authenticate with the token. So let's come over here and check this out real quick and make sure we got it set right. Um, so we did post, new request, um, HTTP address, DNA system. So let's check out that request again because that's telling me that um, system API version one. Oh, I got two, there it is. I've got two forward slashes there and I only need one. So there's my problem. So let's go ahead and try that request again. All right, and there now you can see I got a status code of 200 OK. And here's the value of my token, which is a very large string. So now I can use this token for follow on requests. But problem is I didn't store this token anywhere. So I would have to copy and paste this into the token field for my next request. So let's go ahead and get started on that next request. So I will do a um, new request, request, and we will do this um, as get devices. Um, get list of network devices. And I'm in DNA Center. All right, so I'll save it there. Okay, sweet. So I'll save that, and this is a get request. Surprise that hasn't updated yet. Um, ah, watch if I save it. There we go. Now it says post. Um, so get devices. So now we can come back over here. DNA21 API. I want to do devices and get device list. So here's my path. Actually, I'll go ahead and copy out the. Uh, base URL first. And if I wanted to, I could even now um, store this as an environment variable. So I can come in and edit and I'll do uh, base URL and I'll put in the value. Update that. Close it. Take a look at my environment base URL sandbox. Okay, that looks better. And let's go ahead and update that generate token now. And for right here, we will delete that out. Double curly braces and base URL. And I can just hover over this and then there you can see it's giving me that uh, the value of my environment variable. So we can even run this request again and see if it still works. All right, it still works even uh, using an environment variable. So now we can come back over to get devices and just reference that variable again of base URL. Click that and now we can add in the path for our request. So I'll copy this out, paste it in here. But we want to use I didn't get that. We want to use our token that we generated. So I've got two options right now. I could either uh, copy this whole thing out and I could come paste it under authorization, which is going to be a bearer token. 
I know that from working with um, some of these labs, but again, you could come in here, read the documentation, and it should say somewhere in the headers content type. Um, let's see here if it has the token on here. to look up um, where that's actually stored on the in the documentation so I'm sure if you go and generate authorization and then device inventory uh, here is the request that we're going to be doing um, add X auth token ah X auth token header to your request click headers X auth token and then the value should be that of your token okay so I was wrong with the bearer Maybe they've updated it. So let's see if X auth token is in here anywhere. Uh, no, it still says bearer. Let's check the header and see what it has here. So it hasn't added any, anything in the headers yet. So, okay. Well, we can add it directly here if we want to. But again, this is where I would say we would need to paste in that big long token. So in order to uh, get around that what we're going to want to do is we're going to set up a test to store the value of our token as an environment variable so we still have this token variable with nothing assigned to it so what we're going to do is uh, set an environment variable so I'll just go ahead and uh, click on this right here PM environment variable set variable key which that is going to be token and that down and I'm kind of this is more of a curiosity thing is in this uh, little setup if they have you store this contributing to installing I was curious as if they have you actually um, store this as an environment variable because they should so I'm gonna uh, do my little cheat again real quick because I believe it is um, var and then um, let me go to my other postman instance because I do know I've got that test already so actually I think I have it set up um, in the deck of cards did I do my test here no in the deck test all right var json data this is what I'm looking for so I'll copy that out parse the response body, PM set token, and then the value is going to be uh, JSON data dot deck ID. That, okay, so it'll be JSON data uh, dot token, uh, uppercase, because you can see the response that I'm getting is uppercase, and that should take care of it. So right now our token is not set. So I've declared a variable JSON data and set it equal to JSON parse and then it's going to parse the response body. And then postman environment set the token variable, which has nothing, set token to JSON data dot token, which is going to be this value. So let's go ahead and send that request off again. All right, there I got my token, and if I click my environment variable, you can see now I have a current value of my token. So let's back, head back over to this uh, get devices and this little um, generate authorization and get inventory example. This says add X auth token header to your request. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, I believe in previous versions or other ones that it has you set it to bear, but I, again, I could be wrong. So I'll go ahead and do X. token and this is all case sensitive so I just want to make sure I got that in there right all right cool X auth token and then here I will just go ahead and double curly braces and put in token and we'll go ahead and uh, we'll leave that alone for now I'm a little curious as to what it puts in here because it should put bare but we've got our request all built out 
it's a get request base URL and here's here's the path to the request and then we have our token value put into the headers as per the documentation let's make sure that we have everything else that uh, needs to be in there uh, we want to tell it we want to accept an application JSON though so I'm going to get that out of there and then I'll just do another accept application JSON I'm not passing anything so I don't need to tell it any content type because it's a get request I'm not doing a post so I'm not giving it any information other than my token but that is just included as an HTTP header so I'll go ahead and hit send uh, here you can see my status code is a 200 OK and here's my response body so here I've got a Cisco ASR and if I go down uh, I've got a cat 9k1 and then a cat 9k2 maybe I'll have another one. Oh, and I've got a 3850 so you can see it was successful and now I can always come back over to generate token um, hit code and come down Python requests okay so here it just went ahead and generated that for me um, authorization still set to basic that's not what I want though um, so I can come and copy this out and then I would be able to just paste this into Adam new file and I will do um, get token.py paste this in here import request there's the URL headers authorization um, I don't like this basic in here um, because what I should be doing is um, HTTP basic auth now I'm sure if I ran this again um, so like I'll leave this alone let's save it and I'll go ahead and open up a terminal because let's see what happens alright so I'll go to desktop uh, that's not where I'm at documents documents list I'm going to create a python yeah, I'll go ahead and make this a little bit bigger So list, I'm going to make a Python 3 virtual environment. Source and install requests. Update my requirements.txt file. And let's go ahead and run it and just see what happens. I got my token back. <laughs> All right. So that's one way we could do it. <laughs> um, but realistically, what we want to do is, um, so if I come back over, actually, I need to be back in my terminal. And I'm going to jump into a Python interpreter real quick. Import requests. And then I will do a dir on requests. what I'm looking for is HTTP uh, basic off so let's see if I see it in there at, at all um, I see off down here does not look like okay so I can just do a dir for um, off request off And here I can see HTTP basic auth. Sweet. So um, I could also, you know, do a dir requests dot auth dot HTTP basic auth. Let's see what it comes out. All right. I could do a help on requests dot auth dot HTTP basic auth. And there I can um, read everything that I need to know. But here you can see at the top, it's a class. And uh, HTTP basic auth, it's looking for the username and password. So we'll go ahead and get out of there. Quit. 
I'll clear my screen. Let's come back here, and so we will do from request.off import HTTP basic auth. And there I got my URL, and I could just do a uh, username equals input please provide your username and I'll need get pass so I'll do uh, from get pass import get pass password equals get pass please enter your password So now I've got the username and password, but I still have to do something with it, um, which is part of that HTTP basic auth. So I'm going to come back over because I think there's a way that we can authorization basic. Um, trying to remember exactly how to throw that in there. Cisco WebEx Teams. So it is a collaboration tool. It allows you to chat with other people, um, start up conversations. You can ha host meetings on there. You can record meetings. Uh, collaboration tools really took off once they kind of came out. Um, besides, you know, just the chat functionality, they are kind of fun because you can post pictures, um, GIFs. You can share code with each other, and you can actually share it as code. Um, you can share attachments. It's just a very great way to make it easy. Um, you know, you can create Teams home pages where you've got, you know, a web page or something for that team, have news on it, things of that nature. You can do video conferencing. The other products out there would be, you know, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts, Slack, Flock. They all do the same functionality, and that is that they are just a collaboration tool and or platform. Uh, what I like about them is webhooks. Webhooks are very cool. Um, this is where you start to get into, like, uh, chat bots. If you've ever seen a chat bot, a lot of that has um, is based off of webhooks and APIs. To demonstrate a webhook, we're going to be using uh, Zapier, which is it is free for at least a couple of workflow handlers that we can do. And what that really is is we're going to have a trigger of some sort. And for our example, we're going to say if a GitHub pull request is opened, then its action is going to be to post a message to my WebEx team's room and or space. The, the documentation and the terminology goes back and forth with room, space, room, space, room, space. Uh, it's the same thing. Um, you know, you may click a button in one area on uh, Cisco WebEx Teams and it says create a new uh, room and then another one will say manage this space or you may do an API call and it says space ID or room ID. They're used interchangeably. Don't know why but they're the exact same thing. Uh, but go ahead and download yourself a copy and sign in. You're going to need to create a DevNet, a uh, Cisco DevNet account. Make sure that you sign in to WebEx Teams with the same account that you use to sign up for Cisco DevNet. So that um, that account needs to be the same. Otherwise, your WebEx, or I mean your webhook demonstration for your lab will not work um, because we have to authenticate everything. We have to authenticate Zapier to our to our web, WebEx application and our account, and then it also has to authenticate to our GitHub account so that it can be tied into both. Okay, so here I am in my GitHub repositories. And I just created a repository named uh, Teams Webhooks. I've already downloaded it and created a branch so that I could test this out and make sure everything was working. So I'm gonna come over here to Zapier, which is what we're gonna be using to actually demonstrate uh, webhook. So I'm going to actually delete these out of here. Okay, got it. So delete those. Come on. We have to turn that off. Trash. Trash these two. Okay, so now I'm working with a basically a fresh um, a fresh account. So I'll log out and log back in just so you can see. So I signed up in with my uh, Google account. Uh, it's free to create an account and then it's going to say okay you want to create your own workflow connect this app with this app and what we want to do is connect our github 
and we I do have to use Slack um, because I'm having issues with my WebEx account and I think it's because I have more than one and so it's getting confused or something but I've opened a ticket with Zapier and it's just going to take a while so I'm going to be using Slack instead because I can still demonstrate with Slack you're welcome to use Slack or if you can want to use WebEx Teams you are welcome to use that here is WebEx Teams you can see I created a channel for it um, but again I can't seem to be get Zapier connected to my account um, I already have my GitHub account connected, and if you don't, um, that's fine. Just go ahead and search GitHub, and then whatever collaboration tool that you want to use. So I'm using Slack, and then it's going to ask you, what do you want to happen? Then do this, which is what uh, webhooks are really all about. So I will go ahead and do, mm, I will go ahead and do a pull request. Then we want to send a channel message all right cool and now we will go to um, send channel message in slack when a new pull request in github so we'll click try it and this is where we're actually creating the zap um, again my account's already uh, tied so if it's not it at this point would redirect you to github you would log in and it would redirect you back here um, but there's my github account so i'm going to come down to our Teams webhook repository and then it's already uh, tied to my Slack account as well. I've already signed in and I created the uh, company FSCJ as well as the channel SDN so that we can demonstrate this. So I need to pick a channel. I will choose SDN. Alright, so when a pull request is opened in Teams webhook, uh, for my Slack account, go ahead and post a message to this channel. So I will turn this zap on. I will also view my zaps. Okay, so it is on. And I can even come in here to my zap. Oh, uh, wrong place. That's not where I wanted to go. So come back. Uh, zaps. I can run the zap, I can edit it, rename it, I can share it with other people, I can create folders of different zaps, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and keep that the same. Let me make sure I, I think I got one pull request still open. Yeah, so let, um, like I said, I was just figure, finishing this up, so um, this one is still open, so let me go ahead and merge this real quick so that we're working with a clean slate, so I'll merge, confirm the merge. All right, cool, come back over here. And my main and my webhook should be back up to date with each other. Okay. So now I'm going to come over to Adam, and I'm just going to put um, this is some text to make a pull request. I will save that, stage them, and then commit message, just because this is a demonstration. And I'm on my webhooks branch so I'm now going to push it to my repository it has been pushed so now I'll come over to pull request and open a pull request with myself comparing the webhooks to the main we can see that there is some changes that were made so I will create a pull request and then just uh, demonstrating webhooks and create pull request Okay, so now the pull request has been created. Let's go over to Slack and see what we have. This may take um, a few seconds. It's not instantaneous, but it's also not too far off. I may even need to update a few times. And there it is. All right, cool. So pull request details. Um, pull request number three, it's saying commit message, demonstrating webhooks. It gives me a link um, to the pull request itself. And it says it was sent via Zapier um, app editor. But you can set these up uh, locally if you actually wanted to set up you know, some kind of proxy server or a webhook server where it's just sitting there taking requests and then spitting them off to, um, to different services. 
but this was all accomplished uh, through Slack's API and through GitHub's API. And that is really it. That is what a pull request is. If you come over to Zapier, you'll find that there's actually so many apps that you can choose from, um, so many things that you could do. I mean, I mean, I could come over here to my dashboard. In here, you can see it gives you recommended workflows for Google Docs. Um, you can do Facebook. You can do Twitter. You can do Instagram. Really, th there's so much you can do. So, I mean, I could even do a, a GitHub, and then I want to post a Twitter. I want to tweet. So, there's Twitter. So, uh, fun little tool, and webhooks actually are quite popular. So, recommend, you know, kind of getting in here, checking out the apps, and seeing what it is that you would want to automate. That's all it is, is when something happens, when an event happens, perform this action and all of it is done through the use of APIs. So it's really a cool little demonstration on how we're using APIs to kind of automate just certain processes. So I hope you enjoyed this. Again, for your, um, for your lab, you can use Slack, you can use Microsoft Teams, you can use um, Cisco WebEx Teams. I was just having a problem with my WebEx uh, Teams, so that's why, that's why you'll see that it's a little bit off. Um, because I was having trouble, I'm still having trouble getting it connected in here. Um, it's returning an invalid connection or an expired connection. I can't figure out where to delete that. So hope this was helpful, and I hope you enjoy your lab on webhooks. Thank you. Okay, so in summary, we've gone over Cisco Platform APIs. We've covered Cisco DevNet, what it is, and how it's a great resource for you to continue learning about these next-gen networking solutions and technologies that are all coming out, and they are growing fast. So I highly recommend you get in there, uh, walk through a couple labs, maybe find your interest area, and just play around and keep your skills up to date. Uh, we've covered Cisco WebEx Teams. We've done a little demonstration as far as making a webhook into WebEx Teams. We've covered API documentation, where to get it, um, how it's basically it's mandatory for making a request, and then we've also done a little bit of demo of making an API call to the Cisco DNA Center, always on Sandbox, to retrieve a token, and then use that token on a follow-on request. If you have any questions, please direct them towards the discussion board. If you have that question, chances are someone else in the class has the exact same question, so it's a very useful tool for you to uh, collaborate with others, your peers, bounce ideas off of each other, explain where your thought process was, let them explain their thought process, have healthy debates, and really that's a very great learning tool, so please direct them there. If you do not feel comfortable posting them on the discussion board, the quickest way to reach me is via a quick text message. You can also shoot me an email and or a message on Canvas if you would like. So with that, I leave you to uh, your labs and actually interacting with a real software-defined networking solution and their API. So hope you enjoy this week's lab. Thank you very much.